My family and I live in Brazil, in the city of Belém, a city that is known for its supernatural activity similar to my story. It was in the 70s. My great-grandmother on my mother's side, who we'll call Maria, was a very rich person. She lived in a mansion with her husband, sons, and daughter. Since the house was so big, she had a small staff, a few gardeners, a chef, a couple of maids, etc. Amongst the workers, there was a woman who we'll call Beth. Both names given are false for the sake of anonymity. Beth, according to my great-grandmother, was a really nice and pleasant person. She had a natural charm about her, so much so that a neighbor who we'll call Carlos fell madly in love with her, and she fell for him as well. Carlos's mother found out about the relationship and severely disapproved of it. She was a racist bigot. As Carlos and Beth's relationship solidified more and more, and their engagement became official, Carlos's mother concocted a terrible plan, hell-bent on ending said relationship. She invited Beth for tea. They had a long conversation. It turned out that Carlos's mother told a terrible lie to Beth. She told her that Carlos had been unfaithful and had never intended to marry her. Beth, driven by intense grief and anguish at the perceived betrayal, put on her wedding gown, walked to the laundry area of my great-grandmother's house, doused herself with kerosene and set her dress on fire. Safe to say, no one knew what was happening until her blood-curdling screams started. Every single person in the house ran to help put out the fire and call 911, attempting to save her life. They managed to put out the fire, but Beth's entire body was burned in the process. Pieces of fabric were melded with her skin due to the intense heat. She was in unimaginable pain. The ambulance arrived as she blacked out. My great-grandmother was in shock from seeing a friend commit such a horrible act against herself. She was not able to accompany Beth to the hospital, so she stayed at home, anxiously waiting for news on Beth's condition. Getting tired of staying by the phone, she excused herself to her bathroom to take a shower. As she was on the stairs that went up to her personal bathroom, she started hearing anguishing screams, terrible screams, calling out her name. According to her, it came from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. My great-grandmother stood frozen in intense shock and fear, not knowing whether she should run or cower in the face of such horrific sounds. Once a few terrifying minutes went by, she started screaming for it to stop while she clutched her head but it would not stop, not until she screamed out Beth's name. As soon as she did, the scream stopped. She remained frozen, sitting in abject terror on the stairs, and then she heard her telephone ringing. She ran to the phone and picked it up. It was her husband, my great-grandfather, calling from the hospital. He called to regretfully tell my great-grandmother that Beth had just passed away from her injuries. My great-grandmother had a mental breakdown due to the stress of everything that had happened and had to move out of her house for a long time to try healing her psyche from such terrible events. Fast forward decades later, 2003, I was a child, eight years old, my sister was six. My family still lives in that same house that the terrible event happened. We were playing in our pool with my mother. Everything was fine, until my little sister started staring at a doorway that leads to the laundry area of the house. She kept staring at it for a few minutes, until my mother noticed and grew concerned. She asked my sister what she was staring so intently at, and my sister replied, At the bride. She's pretty. She's smiling at me. My mother turned white as chalk and grabbed us and ran toward our section of the house. Later, I asked her why she was acting so strange. 
and she told me the story I just told you. When I was growing up, my parents had a place on the edge of town. One side was the neighborhood, and the other was hundreds of acres of woods. We used to go explore the woods back there to kill time and build forts, you know? Typical boy stuff like that. I was probably around 13 years old at the time. We never would go too far. We were scared if something bad happened, no one could get to us quickly. And we never told our parents where we were or what we were up to, so they wouldn't even know where to begin to look. Plus, cell phones weren't extremely common back then. One day, we felt extra brave, so we decided to go even deeper into the woods. Now the woods where we lived at the time were super dense, with a ton of underbrush, so you couldn't see out above, or too far ahead of you. So it always seemed dark and very unnerving. This day it was also misty and drizzly, so it made it extra creepy to begin with. We traveled maybe half a mile, and we were not familiar with the area, as we had never gone this far. We picked a random spot, and began cutting down smaller trees to build a fort. After a couple of hours we got bored, and decided to explore some more. We walked a couple of hundred yards, and found a barely visible path. Of course, when you find a path, you have to follow it, right? We followed the narrow path through the dense trees. It wound back and forth for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, we came to a clearing and found an old two-story farmhouse. The treetops loomed over the roof of the house, making it seem much darker. Now what do you think we did? Of course, we had to go inside. At this point we were soaked from being out in the drizzly mist. I went to the door, which was already cracked open a bit. I opened it a little more and peered inside. Nothing too spectacular by any means. A few pieces of rotting furniture and trash littered the dust-covered floor. Parts of the floor were gone, and you could see into the darkness below. The whole house had a bad lean to it, so I didn't dare go upstairs, as it could have very easily fallen over. Upon further investigating, we found a few old handmade creepy dolls. The white fabric was dirty and tattered. Their button eyes had long since fallen off. The whole place just had this super eerie vibe. It was getting late in the evening by this point, so I thought we'd better go back. We left the house and started walking back on the path. Thirty feet out or so, I checked to see if there were any other paths or a road leading to said house. I didn't see anything. As I turned to look back at the house, I swear I saw something move away from one of the second story windows. The curtain was moving ever so slightly. I figured my eyes were playing tricks on me, and I didn't think much of it. We make it back home, and the next day I told one of my other friends about the house, and that I was going to take him there. He comes over, and we head that way. I made sure to tell him all the details on our trek. We get to the path, and are about to round the last bend before the house comes into view. Upon coming to the clearing, I couldn't believe my eyes. The house was completely burned to the ground. Nothing was left, except the concrete risers it was setting on. No ashes, no still smoldering embers, nothing. The ground was still wet from the previous day's precipitation. My friend looked at me in disbelief, like I'd been pulling his leg this entire time. I told him no, I swear it was here yesterday. I walked up to where the house used to be. One of the handmade creepy dolls was just sitting on the ground. We never went back into those woods again. I still drive by them on a daily basis on my way to work. Part of me wants to go back in there and see what I'd find. 
This is a story my mom told me before she passed. This story spans over four days or so. She had already previously felt weird things in the house, but it never manifested itself the way it did this week. One night, my mom went to bed and put on her electric blanket like she did every night. It was the 70s, and this was very common at the time. During the night, she woke up and felt something next to her on the bed. She focused her eyes and saw there was a shadow next to her. But when she stretched her hand out and patted the bed, nothing was there. She shrugged it off and fell back to sleep. The next night, same routine with the electric blanket. She was woken up again by the feeling of something pushing into the palm of her hand. It felt like a finger jabbing it, slowly adding more pressure until she shrieked and turned the light on. Nothing was there. She eventually fell back to sleep. The next night, she went to bed, and at some point was woken up again, but she felt very groggy. She opened her eyes, and at the bottom of the bed, there was a woman sitting. She couldn't make out who. She initially thought it was her mother. She was holding the plug adapter and shaking it vigorously. The woman kept saying, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. My mom was half asleep, thinking it was her mom, and said something like, Mom, go to bed. It's the middle of the night. And again, she fell back to sleep. The next morning, my mom remembered the encounter vividly, so naturally she asked her mother if it was her at the bottom of her bed. Her mom, confused, said no. It wasn't her. My mom told her what the woman said, so they went back to her bedroom. Her chest of drawers was slightly moved out of place, so as her mother went to move it back, she noticed that the socket which the electric blanket was plugged into was completely black. After an electrician came to check it out, he said that if it was left any longer, it could have started an electrical fire. Later. When my mom and her mom were talking, they concluded that it was probably my mom's grandmother trying to look out for them. It's such a crazy story. Makes my eyes water whenever I tell it to someone. The shivers I get are real. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. I grew up in a suburb outside of Dayton, Ohio, where this story takes place. The suburb I grew up in was a rather quiet, upper-middle-class town. With that being said, I had countless glitches and paranormal experiences growing up. There is a park located in a neighborhood in my town that has a walking path. It goes through a lightly wooded area and leads to a large hill. Once you reach the top of the hill, you have a clear view of the surrounding neighborhoods. Also, this hill is the best spot in my town for stargazing. Separating the hill area from the surrounding neighborhoods is a patch of woods that is by no means deep or thick. One night, at about 3 a.m., a few friends and myself decided to go to said park and climb the hill so we could get a good view of the stars. There were a lot of stars out on this night. As we are climbing the hill, all of us started commenting on how we all felt a particular eeriness that none of us could explain. As we are nearing the top, we all stop in our tracks, as we notice a completely white deer standing about 50 yards ahead of us. It was just standing there, looking at us. We were all a little spooked, because none of us had ever seen an albino deer before especially in the suburbs of Dayton. Anyway, the deer runs away, and we momentarily brush it off. Then, as we reach the top of the hill, we all see a flame and are completely awestruck. Somewhere in the thin area of woods separating the park from the surrounding neighborhoods, 
About 200 yards from the top of the hill was a massive blue flame that seemed to be coming from the ground. Since we were kind of far from it, it's hard to know exactly how tall this flame was, but I would guess it was at least 30 feet tall and 15 feet wide. Like I said, it was massive. Another weird thing about the flame was there was no noise coming from it or from the area near it to suggest it was coming from an artificial source, such as some kind of exhaust flame or something. Needless to say, my friends and I are captivated by this anomaly, and we are just staring at it as it continues to steadily burn. The strange thing is, this flame had some kind of pull on us. It was almost hypnotizing. It was difficult to look away. Finally, I am able to move my attention away, and I get all my friends to snap out of it. We then realized that we had been standing there for over an hour. All of us, just staring at this flame, but it felt like only moments had passed since we first spotted it from our vantage point atop the hill. We all exchanged scared glances, and then simultaneously booked it down the hill and back to our cars. We were all pretty freaked out, and nobody could explain the flame or the loss of time. Once back in our cars, we decided to drive around the neighborhoods to try and see the flame from another angle. But when we reached the area where the flame was, we found nothing. No evidence that a massive flame was burning there just minutes ago. So what was this flame, and why was it so hypnotizing? Why did we stare at it for over an hour without realizing it, and where did it go? My friends and I have been back since, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. And no, we were not drunk or high, just a few high school kids out for a late night adventure. I get If anyone has a solid idea of what this was, or if they have had a similar experience, I would love to hear it. This happened to me a while back, when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and hike about 15 to 20 miles in, until I find the right spot. Then I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this big clearing, and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and managed to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that, and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire, crawl into my tent, and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted, with the dragging noise following seconds after, like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. And I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent 
and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the fuck? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and try to not let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. Eventually, I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughter from a couple other different directions. All different. Old men, old women, even children. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot in the air if they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, but saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I scared whoever off, I laid back, and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety. It was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and try to listen to what they are saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly, a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. Never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that night. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. Links to all my shit are down in the description. Come follow me on social media and join my Discord. I need some haiku competition. I've built a time machine, and I'm just about ready to fire it up. So let's see how this goes. Alright, the spec lines on the rotary girder look good. The flux capacitor is fluxing. Ripley, I'll be right back. was a trip. Alright, we got some form of early man here. Hey buddy. Ah! Oh I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to scare you. Ah, ah, ah! 
All right, all right, take it easy. I didn't mean to scare you. My name is Corey. What's your name? Huh? I'm Corey. Corey. Gary Ollie. Corey. Gary Ollie. What's your name? I don't know. Actually, don't worry, but forget it. Hey, check this out. It's called a lighter. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool, huh? Yes. Fire. <laughs> you probably haven't mastered fire yet. I bet you've only seen it when lightning strikes. This is going to change everything, my friend. When you figure out how to use it. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, hold on. I will give you this lighter. From me to you. Just point me in the direction of the hairy she-beasts. The ladies, you know. Like, oh, ba 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 Like that. The ladies. Well, let me do this. You know what this means. <laughs> yeah, the universal sign for titties. Yeah! <laughs> okay, this way? Yeah! <laughs> Alright, my friend, a deal is a deal. Here's your lighter. Oh. Let me show you like this. See that? <laughs> Now be careful, don't light yourself on fire. <laughs> now eventually that's gonna run out. So use it wisely. Huh? Yeah, who am I kidding? You don't have a clue what the fuck I'm talking about. Alright, buddy. Hey, listen, nice to meet you. And it might be time to hit the river, because you fucking stink. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Alright, guys, listen, I'm signing off. And as always, be good to animals, even people. See ya. Yo, Snemok, Barksmas, Hirsch. Money! Jamming.